Hey guys, this should be the last lecture on genetic technology. We should be able to wrap it up here. We've got three technologies we need to talk about. Let's dive right in. Gel electrophoresis is the first one. The gel in gel electrophoresis is made using a sugar called agarose, and it works a lot the way uh, collagen does or, or gelatin, what we, what we use to make jello. Um, you can take a powder, mix it with some water, heat it up, and it will dissolve. And as it cools, it will polymerize. And so it makes a matrix. And what a matrix is, is just a network. So it, these fibers polymerize every which way in this as it cools, and it traps water in between those strands. And so, so in this picture here, this is an electron micrograph of an agarose gel. And so you can see it's lots of little holes with all these fibers through it. And so the holes, all these spaces would be filled with water. And so if you imagine DNA moving through this gel, you can see that it would be going through all these little holes. And if there were a small piece of DNA, it would be able to go through there pretty quickly. But if it were a big piece of DNA, it would get caught and would go a lot more slowly because it'd be harder to get it to wind its way through all these little holes. So all we need to do now that we have this matrix is try and push DNA through it. So we wanna move DNA. If you look at the structure of DNA, you'll remember they have these phosphates, right? All the way up and down both sides. And of course, the other strand would have those too. And the phosphates all have a little negatively charged oxygen right there. So the entire molecule of DNA is negatively charged. So the way we're going to make this move is to put it in an electric field. We put a negative charge at one end. We put a positive charge at the other end, right? And making this electric field, we put the DNA into the, this little hole in the well. And this yellow block here, what they really are is it's a tray about this big. It's, you know, maybe this deep of agros and it's firmed up. You pour it in as a liquid and then it cools and hardens just like jello. And it's got these little holes in it. And we put the DNA in those holes. And then you put it in a tank with some buffer. The tank has two wires running on either side and you hook that up to a positive and negative lead and you make an electric field. So now the DNA wants to move. It wants to get away from the negative, wants to head towards the positive because it's a negatively charged molecule. So when you let it run, the small pieces go faster than the big pieces. And you shut it off before the small ones run off the end. And then you stain the DNA and you can see which fragments of DNA you have. And by running some standards next to it, you can know roughly how big those pieces are. So it's a way to sort out molecules by size. We do this with DNA, we do it with proteins. I've done it with different colored dyes and things like that. There's a lot of different molecules. Any molecule with a charge that's not too small or too big will be able to sort out with electrophoresis. Stuff that's too big tends to just stay here in the well. Stuff that's too small goes through so fast that it's, you know, it's not even staying together. So to do this, we need fragments of DNA. We need pieces of DNA. And of course, we've already talked about how you can cut up DNA. You can use restriction enzymes from the last presentation. Now my DNA and someone else's DNA are not gonna be exactly the same, obviously, but certain parts will be. Like my code for hemoglobin is pretty much the same as everybody's code for hemoglobin. There are exceptions, of course. So you wanna pick the parts of the DNA that are different. And so it's a lot of the places between genes, places where there's been transposons that have been put in in some people and not in others. So places that vary. In one of my chromosomes, there may be a restriction site, a place where a restriction enzyme cuts that someone else doesn't have that restriction site because of mutation. So I could end up with different size fragments than somebody else because of insertions, deletions, different mutations, all kinds of different ways that we could end up with different size fragments. And so as we take certain parts of the DNA, cut it into pieces, run it in a gel, my pieces are gonna line up in a different pattern than someone else. And this is how you generate a DNA fingerprint. So all we're doing is cutting up DNA into different fragments using restriction enzymes. So if I take your DNA and I cut it with ECHOR1, a restriction enzyme, and then I take your DNA a week from now and cut it with ECHOR1 again, it's gonna be cut in the exact same locations because those are built into the DNA. But if I cut someone else's DNA with the same restriction enzyme, I'll get different fragments because their restriction sites are farther apart or closer together randomly. So in AP, we get a lot of these little simple diagrams. They look a lot like this. Um, just simple bands representing different size fragments of DNA. So pause this video and answer this question. Where on this gel are the smaller fragments of DNA? 
So hopefully you saw that the negative end is here. These are the wells, these dark purple wells. Here's the positive end, the negative end. The DNA is going this way. So the small fragments are these down here because they travel faster because they go through that matrix more easily. The large fragments are up near the top, still haven't traveled far from the well. So looking at this gel, can you tell who the suspect is? Pause the video again and answer that question. So you see the crime scene sample. Here's the victim. Um, and I've got three suspects. And if I look, here's the first band of the crime scene sample. It looks like either of those two. That doesn't look good. How about this person? Uh, okay, so it looks like it's suspect two. And all the other three, they also match suspect two. So suspect two, you're in trouble. Here's a picture of a gel from an actual crime scene. This is blood from the defendant's clothes. And this is the victim's blood. This is the defendant's. The defendant claimed that the blood was his own, but you can see here's his DNA and here's the DNA that was on his shirt. And it's not the same and it matches the victim's perfectly. So you have the victim's blood on your clothes. That seems suspicious. Uh, here's another one from an actual crime scene. Uh, this is a murder trial. So you can see the blood samples from the crime scene. These two here have a particular pattern that seems to show up here in this. This is from the suspect, so that doesn't look good. The suspect left some blood at the crime scene. Uh, the other blood that was at the crime scene belonged to this victim. What's interesting about this one, say you might have heard some of these names, probably one of them anyway, but the glove didn't fit. We can also use this for diagnosing genetic conditions, but for that to work, the two different versions of the gene have to generate different size restriction fragments, meaning they have different restriction sites in them or some insertion or deletion that makes the pieces different sizes. But we can often find a mutation that shows up in electrophoresis. So when we do electrophoresis of just that piece of DNA, we can see that it has different versions. Of course, this is also used for paternity. And again, really with all these that we've been talking about, we don't use restriction fragments so much as we used to. Now we're gonna generate those fragments of DNA using PCR instead of restriction enzymes. We'll get to that in a minute. Either way, you're gonna get the same types of patterns. So you can look at this, pause the video, see if you can figure out who the father of the child is. When you're looking at a gel from a paternity case, uh, you wanna be able to identify any pieces of DNA that the child has that they didn't get from mom because those had to come from dad. So. Here's mom, that came from mom. This one did not. Uh, this one did not. That came from mom. This one did not come from mom. That came from mom. And that came from mom. So we need to account for these four fragments of DNA. And if you look, there's only one of these two guys that has this. And it looks like F2 just sank your battleship. We can also look at evolutionary relationships. The DNA fingerprints of more closely related species are going to be more similar than those between more distantly related species. So, you know, looking at this, you can make a cladogram. You can see, right, three and four seem to be pretty closely related, and one and two also seem to be closely related. There's only one difference between one and two, and only one difference between three and four. Organism five here has uh, some similarities with the others, but it is definitely the outgroup. So we'd make a cladogram, and it would look like this, right? With five being that one that's most different, three and four being most closely related to each other, and one and two being most closely related to each other. So we can use electrophoresis to generate cladograms. So it's another avenue of evidence that we kind of talked about before. All right, so we're moving on to DNA sequencing. It uses a different version of a nucleotide. So let me explain that. Remember, deoxyribonucleic acid has deoxyribose, which means it's missing a hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. So it's just an H instead of an OH. But if I take out this OH and make it, make it also just an H, well, now I can't stick another nucleotide there because that's a three prime carbon where we attach the next nucleotide. DNA polymerase is gonna extend off the three prime end. But if it doesn't have a hydroxyl, I can't do dehydration synthesis and therefore I can't add another nucleotide. So I'm gonna stop replication anytime I stick a nucleotide on that uses this sugar. So we've taken two oxygens off of this guy. So it is called dideoxy. Remember, this is deoxyribonucleic acid. This is dideoxyribonucleic acid. So we've taken two oxygens off and that's gonna stop replication. Dideoxynucleotides will stop replication. So we're gonna put all of these things into test tubes. We're gonna have the DNA that we wanna sequence. We're gonna have DNA polymerase so that we can build a complementary strand. 
we're going to have our nucleotides, but of course they're going to be in the triphosphate version because we need them to bring their own energy as well. We're going to need primers so the DNA polymerase has something to extend off of. And then we're going to take all of those things and put it into four separate test tubes. Now in the first tube, we're going to add a little bit of dideoxy ATP. So A's that can't be extended off of. A's that are going to stop replication. We're going to do the same thing in the next tube with C's, the next tube with T's, the next tube with G's. So every piece of DNA here, the DNA polymerase is going to extend. It's going to be sticking on a T, sticking on an A, a G, whatever. And sometimes when it goes to stick on an A, it'll grab a normal one because they're in there. We said that. And it'll be fine. It'll just move right on. But sometimes it'll grab one of these dideoxyates and stick that on there. And if that is on there, then we can no longer extend. So we're done doing replication. So we're going to end up with a shorter fragment. But we're going to end up with a shorter fragment that ends in an A. We know that. And in the next tube, we're going to have fragments of various lengths that all end in a C. And in the next tube, we're going to have fragments of various lengths that all end in a T. And we're going to have fragments of various lengths that end, all end in a G. So all we need now is a way to sort out fragments by size, which is what gel electrophoresis is. We just did that. And so you get these huge gels like this. And if you look closely at any four columns of this, it looks a lot like this picture here. And you can see the pieces that traveled farther, of course, are smaller. So here's a small fragment that has a G. And here's a small fragment that ends in an A. Small fragment here that ends in a T. There's a small fragment here that ends in a C. And then another one with a T. And so we've got these different length fragments but we can figure out exactly, so this one ended in an A, and the one that was a little bit smaller, that ended in a T. And the one that was a little bit smaller ended in a C. So we know, since these are all copied from the same strand of DNA, we can start putting together the actual sequence. Let me show you a little video that kind of demonstrates how this works. So here's our double-stranded DNA. This is a very artistic video. Of course, I only need one strand of it because I can figure out what the other one's going to be if I have just one. I don't know what the sequence is on this strand of DNA. I'm going to make a bunch of copies of it. And then I'm going to use those copies to make sequences of DNA that end with those dideoxys. And in my G tube, I'm going to end up with fragments of different lengths that all end in G. And from that, I can figure out where all the G's are. I do the same thing figure out where all the A's are, where all the C's are, where all the T's are. And by putting all those together, I can figure out the entire sequence of DNA. And because those fragments all travel different distances, I can sort out the entire sequence of the DNA. Nowadays, um, this is done with much better technology than just a gel and somebody looking at those pictures. That was how it originally started. But we couldn't do an entire human genome. We'd still be working on it if we had people looking at those things. Um, so we have computers now that can do this. We will, instead of tagging the DNA with the dideoxys, the dideoxys are also tagged with a color so that they fluoresce red or green or blue or yellow. And a computer can detect that. So instead of running the gel in a sheet, we, we run it in a, a tube. And then a computer can just scan down this tube and it can look at the different colors. The tubes look like this here on the right. And so you can see there are, you know, different colors as they're going through, and a computer can read these. So you just do segment after segment of DNA. So you chop up a chromosome into a bunch of pieces, sequence each of those pieces, and then all you have to do is look for overlapping sequences, and you can figure out the sequence of the entire chromosome. So it's a little bit messy, but and it takes a while. But with computers, that's what they're good at. All right, so we need to talk about PCR. It's the last thing we need to do. PCR stands for polymerase. which of course is the enzyme that builds DNA. Chain reaction. And I don't know how much you learned in physics about chain reactions, but nuclear bombs and power plants work this way. Um, it's basically where one thing causes two things, causes four things, causes, right? And each of those one things continues to go on. Um, and in PCR, we're gonna do that same thing. We're gonna do a polymerase chain reaction. We're gonna take one strand of DNA, we're gonna unzip it, we're gonna build a complementary strand, and then we're very quickly gonna unzip those build complementary strands. So now we're up to four double helixes. And then we're going to do it again. We get eight double helixes, 16, 32, 64. Pretty soon we got lots and lots of DNA. So we're going to run it through a cycle that every time doubles the number of copies we have of this DNA. So this is called DNA amplification. 
meaning we take a little sample and we make it huge. This is how we can get you know, DNA from a cigarette butt, which may have just two, three cells on it, and amplify it to make enough copies of that DNA to be able to do like a DNA fingerprint. We can take a cheek swab from somebody and amplify the DNA to get a DNA fingerprint. We can make as much of the DNA as we want. So PCR's purpose is to amplify DNA, make lots and lots of copies. It does this using a thermocycler, and thermo, of course, means heat. Cycler means it goes through a cycle. And so all it does, a thermocycler just goes through different temperatures in a cycle over and over again. We have one of these at school. We do PCR every year in AP Bio, every year except this year. But all it does is heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down. So you put a little tube into the thermocycler, and that tube has four things in there. It has the sample of DNA that you want to amplify. Right? And sometimes that's called the template. That's the thing we're going to amplify. Or sometimes it's called the target. This is the target DNA. We need primers. And those primers need to bracket, right? meaning be on either end of the target sequence. which again is the part that we want to amplify. We're not going to do this with the entire genome. We're going to do this with a specific part. We need nucleotides. Technically, they're nucleosides, right? Uh, because they got to bring their own energy. A's, T's, C's, and G's. And the last thing, of course, that we need is DNA polymerase. But the penguin has a good question here. What is 90 degrees Celsius going to do to a human DNA polymerase? Right, 90 degrees Celsius is almost boiling. You should be able to answer that question with one word. Pause the video and tell me that word. Hopefully you figured out that word is denature. We're going to lose that protein. So instead of using human polymerase or goat polymerase or, you know, whatever, we use polymerase from bacteria that lives in hot springs. Dr. Kerry Mullis, the guy that came up with this, had an aha moment when he was at Yellowstone. I went, wait a minute, I just figured out how we can heat up DNA polymerase. We use the DNA of the bacteria that live here because they live in places that the water frequently gets really close to boiling and they survive that. So their polymerase is stable at high temperatures. It's not terribly effective when it's at high temperatures, but when you cool it down, it works great. And you can heat it up and cool it down again and it still works great. So we use what's called TAC polymerase. TAC is short for Thermus aquaticus, which is a species of bacteria that they got from the hot springs. The primers, of course, are critical because they are going to bracket the sequence that you want to amplify. We're not going to amplify the entire genome. When we do this in class, normally, um, we amplify one little spot in chromosome number 11 that sometimes has an insertion in some people and doesn't in others so that we get two different variations. But we only amplify that part. We're not amplifying the whole genome. And that's always the case. Now, if you're going to make a DNA fingerprint, you're going to have a lot of pairs of primers because you're going to amplify a lot of fragments of DNA uh, in the genome that we know vary from person to person so that you get a big combination of these variable sections. Let me show you another little video that shows how PCR works. So here's our DNA, and there's a little thermometer here on the left. As I heat it up, the DNA unwinds and unzips. Remember, DNA denatures by breaking just the hydrogen bonds, just like proteins, but that means they unzip. So we heat it up, it unzips. When we cool it down again, that makes the primers get in there. Now, the DNA sometimes goes back together, but a primer is much smaller, so it tends to get in there quicker. So most of the time, a primer is going to bind to this open strand of DNA before the DNA can zip back up. So I stick a primer on there, then I warm it up a little bit to really activate the DNA polymerase. Remember, it's got a, a peak of activity, and at 72 degrees, roughly, TAC polymerase works really, really well. And so it's going to extend off of those primers and copy that DNA. But then I heat it up again, and those unzip. And then when I cool it down, the primers stick again. warm it up a little bit to get the, heal the polymerase active. And we just keep doing this. And if you look over time, so we do still have some of these long strands, but over time, we're gonna end up with a whole bunch of these short target sequences. And those can be sorted using electrophoresis. And these big pieces, they'll all stay in the well in electrophoresis because they're too big.
So you end up amplifying that target sequence and only that target sequence. You know, I don't know if you guys have noticed this lately, but the test that they use for uh, coronavirus, it's called an RT-PCR test. I told you already, it's an RNA virus. So the RT is reverse transcriptase, the PCR is P polymerase chain reaction. So what they do is they take a swab and they go way back into your nasal pharynx, um, swab there because the virus likes to hang out there. So they're gonna get some of your cells, they're gonna get some of the virus, they're gonna get all that stuff. So they'll isolate the RNA, use reverse transcriptase to turn it into DNA, and then they do PCR, but they're using primers that are only in the sequence of the viral RNA. If you get a lot of copies of that DNA, then you know already that you've got the virus because those copies came from the viral. They're not gonna amplify your DNA, they're gonna amplify the viral DNA because of what primers they chose to put on there. Kind of a cool trick. Okay, so looking at these last two lectures, the, the main things that AP asks about, Bacterial transformation, a lot of stuff about that. Uh, marker genes are one of the things they like to ask a, a lot about um, in transformation. Um, gel electrophoresis, and sometimes they'll have diagrams. Gel electrophoresis, sometimes they'll have diagrams. DNA sequencing, yeah, understanding that it stops at the dideoxy. Um, usually it's not even that complicated, though it's pretty straightforward. And then PCR, and really just understanding that it amplifies a particular sequence and that, you know, and the components that go into the tube that's all you really need to know. Don't completely neglect everything else. Um, we'd left out a lot of stuff already that they're not gonna ask you about. There's no transgenic plants, transgenic animals. That's normally stuff I'd talk about, you know, goats that produce spider silk in their milk and things like that. So I'll have a little quiz slash test coming up on uh, Wednesday, probably in the neighborhood of 20-ish. Multiple choice questions shouldn't be too bad. And the AP exam is just around the corner, so we'll start getting prepared for that as soon as we get done with this. Hang in there, guys. You're doing great. Please, please try to keep up. Do everything when you're supposed to do it. Don't put it off till later. You're going to get burnt. You can do well on this AP exam if you do it right. Love you guys.